All right. Um, oh, it's being recorded. Okay, excellent. Um, well, thanks everyone for, for coming. It's my uh, pleasure to introduce uh, Raphael Dandria to give the IECS uh, seminar today. Um, like, um, like me, uh, Raphael hails from um, physics. So he did his undergraduate degree in physics in Brazil and then went on to get a master's degree in physics. Um, came to Stony Brook then um, for uh, physics and got a, a master's in physics in 2010 and then went to the University of Michigan to do a PhD in ecology and evolutionary biology in 2016. Uh, from there, he went on to do a, a, a postdoc uh, at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And then we recruited him here. Uh, and he's uh, still quite a new uh, assistant professor in our department, um, working in mathematical models for uh, ecological communities as he'll, he'll tell you all about today. So um, with that, I will hand things over to Raphael. Thank you. All right, so can everybody see the slide? Yep, I can see it. Yes. Okay, good. All right. So <clears throat> the question then is, do competing species coexist via differences or do they coexist via similarities? And the answer, and I'm already giving you the answer, so it's probably not good uh, to keep the suspense, is that it's not so simple. Although it is kind of a frustrating answer. <clears throat> okay, so. As soon as I can, okay, good. So competition is one of the fundamental interactions among species in nature. It is ubiquitous. So this is a picture of a tropical forest. Uh, in tropical forests, you have uh, warm temperatures and a lot of rain. So there are a lot of resources uh, for, for plants and all of those plants need the same resources. So presumably there's a lot of competition going on in there. And one of the questions that ecologists interested in species assemblages like forests is how does competition shape biodiversity? Meaning, are there patterns of biodiversity that we can attribute to competition? So one way to look at that is through species phenotypes, AKA traits. So phenotypes influence how species compete. That's not a controversial statement. Uh, so for example, here, uh, we have uh, birds that eat seeds. And the phenotype of interest in this case is the shape of the beak. And it relates to the diet of the bird. So assuming that there are birds eat seeds, we can imagine that birds with small seeds eat small, birds with small beaks eat small seeds, birds with big beaks eat big seeds and some distribution in, in their diet. Uh, and because of uh, that distribution, there will be some overlap in diet, so therefore some competition. So definitely competition should relate to traits. And it's natural to assume that it will filter species with the appropriate traits. Um, um, species that don't have appropriate traits simply won't survive uh, because they will be outcompeted. So that's the general idea. Competing species will have non-random uh, trait distributions. So I spoke about birds, and I think that's the last I'll talk about animals in this talk. Um, let's go back to tropical forest. So this is a picture that I took at uh, Barrow, Colorado Island. So we have here different species of plants with different traits. Um, and the question is, do we see patterns in traits, trait patterns that are um, revealing of competition being an important driving force there? Hide the video panel so it doesn't bother me. Oh, somehow it's still there. All right. Um, so here is a depiction of all of the trees inside a 500, uh, is it 500? No, I'm a 50 hectare plot inside the middle of the island. Okay, so those are all the species. Each stem here is a species. And I'm ordering my species by how tall the tree gets to be. So, you know, maximum height of the species. And this axis is abundance, right? So this represents the entire community and the trading question here is maximum height. So to give you one specific example, this species here is my favorite species on the island, the running palm. So Curtea exoriza, it looks like it's running away. Um, it's kind of a funny looking tree. So the question to the audience now, and I want some audience, audience participation is, is this community being shaped by competition? Do you see a competition-like pattern uh, on, 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 in this plot. Well, it's certainly not uniformly distributed. They do not look uniformly distributed. 
that that's that is a fact. So I guess the answer to the question is another question, right? Which is what would you expect competition to look like in a community, right? You need to know that before you can answer this question. Is there a competition shape is competition shaping this? So to get there, we start with part zero, which is what does the theory say? So the classic community assembly paradigm is, so back to Barrow, Colorado Island, it's an island in the middle of the Panama Canal. The classic paradigm is this island, this island is surrounded by uh, a bigger community, right? That, which forms a species pool. Uh, so those are species that can disperse into the island, right? And the paradigm is species disperse randomly into the local community, and then the abiotic environment in the island, which is a subset of the abiotic environment in all of Panama, uh, will filter species that come in here based on their ability to survive the local environment. So that would get you from a wide range of species traits to a subset of allowed traits that can survive inside your local community, right? So habitat filtering does that to you, would limit the range of traits that are allowed. And then competition inside the local community would filter out species that are too similar to each other to coexist. So what's the deal with similarity? Well, it's the intuitive idea that species that have similar phenotypes compete for resources in similar ways. And therefore competition is very strong. And since competition is, has a negative effect on population growth, you would expect a species under too much competition to simply go extinct. So then, the intuitive idea is that those that remain are those that are sufficiently different from each other, the competition between them is not too high. And that's called limiting similarity. Now, that idea, like I said a few times now, is very intuitive. The problem with it is that there's underwhelming empirical evidence for it. So this is a classical book on ecological niches, uh, which did a meta-analysis of the evidence for limiting similarity in nature. And essentially what it finds is you find limiting similarity less than half the time. In fact, more than half the time, you find the opposite situation. Species are actually more similar than you would expect by chance. And that's whether you measure it through uh, a trait like body size or where you try to estimate resource use overlap. So you end up seeing more resource use overlap than you would expect by chance um, more than half the time. Typically, when somebody finds that, that species are more similar than expected by chance, the interpretation is, oh, it's not competition that matters here. It's actually habitat filtering. It's that first filter that is the strongest one uh, in play here. But I will argue that um, it doesn't have to be that. I would argue that we need to be more careful about what we expect from the effects of competition. So let me ask, how does competition shape communities in models? And I will start with not just any model, but the model. This is the most classical model of competition that you're going to find in your textbooks. This is Lockable Volterra competition, basically saying that um, if N here is the size of the population, then its rate of growth is, is exponential, except that the, uh, the constant is not constant. It depends on the abundance of the species. So it decreases as the species abundance increases. So you have some kind of um, regulated growth here. That regulation comes from the abundances of every species in the community. And that constant that relates the competitive impact uh, of species G on species I is called the competition coefficient. That's the star of our model here. Um, what would be a natural way to write a competition coefficient? If we're thinking of species in terms of their traits, so back to the birds, I said it was the last time I was gonna talk about animals, I lied. So here are birds again. Uh, let's line them up by beak size, right? And now let's focus on the, the bird with a medium-sized beak. How much does it compete with itself? Well, it's identical to itself, so it probably competes a lot with itself. And then in terms of birds with different beak sizes, it competes less with them. So this is a very, you know, common idea in, in community ecology. Similarity breeds competition. So let's put that in the model, right? And now that I have, and I'm going to make this the same for every species. So the only thing mattering here in this model is trade similarity between species makes competition stronger. Okay. And now let's simulate this model. All right. Like I said, this is the most common model in, of competition in community ecology. So if limiting similarity is the law of the land, then it should definitely come out of this. 
All right, so simulating the model. Uh, well, I probably should explain this a lot before. You've seen something like this before. Each stem is a species. I'm starting my community with every species having similar abundance. Doesn't matter if they start with equal or unequal abundances, just starting with equal abundances for uh, simplicity. Uh, they are lined up by their trait here, and here's their abundance. So now the simulation shows you over time what happens to the abundances of my species. This is a closed community. There's no dispersal into it, so species can only go extinct. They can't come back. So actually, let me yeah restart from scratch. And you notice a few things here, right? So question, it's starting to slow down because this is reaching equilibrium now. What's going to happen at the very end? How many species are we going to have coexisting here? Someone in the audience that I can't. It looks see. like you're still going to have six at least. Doesn't look like it's going to go to one. Doesn't look like it's going to go to one. Yeah. So you end up with six species. And the six species, their traits are very non random, right? They're very evenly spaced. So they're as they're maximally different from each other, right? So this is limiting similarity, right? Everybody that had a trait that was not allowed went away. The traits that are allowed are the traits that are the most different possible. Y6 has to do with the width of this curve, right? I make it narrower, I get more, I make it wider, I get fewer. But, how many did you start with? Sorry, I think I, I, um, I can't oh, remember. Oh, I started how many. with about 200 or something. Um, oh, okay, okay, yeah. yeah. So oh, oh, oh gotcha. Here, yeah. So they're going away pretty quickly. But the interesting thing is the dynamics as well, right? So the ones in the middle went away pretty quickly. Now, the ones close to the ones th that win go away very slowly. And this is interesting, right? Because if for some reason your community is not in equilibrium, what you end up seeing is the opposite of, sim of limiting similarity. You see groups of species that are actually very similar to each other in your community, right? So my question now is what happens when you add other phenomena that are not happening, that are not here, other processes that are also common in nature, such as dispersal or immigration and ecological drift or stochasticity, right? So again, take that classical model of competition between species, make it probabilistic and allow for random immigration into the community, okay? Do we still see something like what we saw before? So here's a result, here's a simulation of this model here where basically you have species coming into the community and then competing with each other based on trait similarity. So what you see now is, well, to begin with, abundances aren't just neatly asymptoting to some um, final value. They're dancing around because of stochasticity. And there's some noise as well. And the question now is, is there a pattern here, right? Is this non-random? It probably looks non-random to everybody. It also looks non-random to me. But does it look non-random in a specific way? So to get to that, um, I had to come up with some statistic that would tell me that community wasn't random, and I'm just going to go over it pretty quickly here. Well, I'm looking for species clusters inspired by that first simulation you saw when the species formed uh, clusters. <laughs> clusters. So basically, I used k-means, which is a very well-known um, clustering algorithm. Uh, k-means works, the way it works is you uh, tell it, I want to find four clusters in my data. Can you uh, assign uh, a cluster to each of my data points, in, in this case, my species. And it will do that uh, by optimizing uh, dispersion inside each of the clusters, right? So it will minimize dispersion inside each cluster. So we'll find the assignment of species to clusters that minimizes dispersion. Problem with that index is it is agnostic with regards to the number of clusters you should look for. And not only that, but if you look for more clusters, you find lower dispersion simply because there are fewer species in each cluster when you look for more. So you can't just go by this to decide how many clusters you have, right? So I was um, faced with the issue of finding not only whether my community was clustered or not, but also how many clusters there were. So one way to do that is to use the gap statistic. Basically, you perform k-means on reference communities, which could be some random sample of the species pool or some randomized version of your observation of your data, right? And then you get your k-means curve for that data and you do that multiple times. Then you can take the mean and then you can compare what you actually observe for your data against the expectation from reference communities that you know to not be clustered, right? When you do the difference between that red curve and the black curve, you get something like this. This curve peaks at four 
indicating that indeed there are four clusters here, right? You try to do that on your reference communities, you get something like this indicating there are six clusters here, but um, if you now compare um, the peak against the distribution of the peak across the references, you see that this peak is significant, whereas this one is not. So that's a way to find clusters in, in messy data like this. And sure enough, when you throw that method on this community, you find, in this case, there are 13 groups. Okay, And this is very distinctive from a random community. So before I get to the summary slide for the theory part, one last thing to protect yourself against is the idea that you might be seeing an artifact of a very simple model, the lockable terra model of competition. So is that type of pattern general across different niche mechanisms? One of the common criticisms of lockable terra competition is that it is not a mechanistic model, it's phenomenological. So to get around that, you can simulate a model of consumers consuming resources. Uh, where you explicitly keep track of the consumers and the resources, and the consumers only compete indirectly through their depletion of resources. What happens there? Well, I found that you also see clustering of species of consumers. Okay, so the, the, the clustering of species by trait is also observed in mechanistic niche models. Not only consumer resource, but maybe if your resource is the environment, it's like abiotic uh, resource. So <coughs> seeds adapted to different environmental conditions. If you have a model like that and same idea, you know, dispersal and stochasticity, but the niche mechanism is different, do you still see clustering? The answer is yes, you do. Uh, competition colonization trade-off. This one is important for plants. So one uh, idea is that plants and forests compete because they specialize into different strategies having to do with size and quantity of seed output. So some plants produce lots of seeds. The seeds are small, cheap to make. Some plants produce few seeds. The, cheaps are big, the, the seeds are big, high quality, lots of uh, parental subsidies. So expensive to make, you don't, to make, don't make too many of them. So a community like that, where species are competing by separating into niches like that, does it still show clusters? The answer is yes. You may notice that by just looking at um, the, the plots, you can't really tell whether this is clustered or, or you know, random, and I'm just randomly painting, some of them red, some of them black, to look like clusters. But I'm applying a statistical test here to tell me that these things are clustered. And sure enough, when I try a, a, a model where competition between species is independent of their trait, then actually there is no uh, clustering pattern of species by trait. OK, that's called neutrality. And uh, so this works as a sanity check for the idea that I am proposing here that usually when you have competition, you're going to see something like this. All right. So what's the, 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 the takeaway from, from this part, from the theory? Competition will make species cluster by trait, not show limiting similarity, at least in the general conditions where you know, have dispersal and you have stochasticity. The clusters can be interpreted as niches. The clusters themselves are well separated from each other. But the species within the clusters are actually mutually similar because they share the niche. And that happens regardless of habitat filtering. So you might recall that when I show that table with um, the meta-analysis, meta the general interpretation is when you see species more similar to each other than expected by chance, you say, oh, the, the environment is filtering my species. And what you just saw is models where this is not happening. And yet what you get is species look more similar to each other than expected by chance if you naively just look at you know, uh, nearest neighbors on trade space, which people do a lot. Okay, so that's the theory. So now what does the data say? So I'll split this in two parts. One is competition for light and two is competition for nutrients. So let's start with competition for light. Going back to, um, to that plot that I've shown you before, Barra Colorado Island, all of my species on Barra Colorado Island organized by max height with their abundances here is uh, this community being shaped by competition. So now basically we know to turn this question into do I see clusters of species? And the answer is you do, you see four of them. Uh, you have understory shrubs, uh, you have shrubs, understory treelets, midstory trees, and canopy trees. Okay, so this is the gap curve, um, similar to what I showed you before when I was showing you the validation tests, uh, showing a clear peak at four, and that peak is uh, significant. Uh, so here are some examples of the trees. Here's that running palm again. This time I'm there. 
uh, super happy to have actually spotted one in a forest. It's pretty cool. Uh, so <clears throat> Veracolardo Island is layered into four layers of maximum height. Well, one uh, interesting thing about this finding is that natural historians have distinguished four layers in tropical forests dating all the way back to the 50s. And I am now connecting it to competitions. So I'm giving it a process for this pattern. Or you could be asking yourself, why four, right? So before, when I, when I asked why six birds instead of you know, 10 or three, uh, the answer was how wide that competition curve was. How about here? Well, one possible explanation for why four is the sunfleck model. So it just has to do with the way the light uh, will uh, below the canopy in a tropical forest, uh, the, the levels of in light incidence by height. So obviously at the top of the canopy, there's a lot of light. And then um, trees start blocking light, but there will be some angles, um, some, some vertical heights where rays of light coming from different directions during the day Will, uh, co will converge. So those will be areas below the canopy that actually have an unusually high amount of light, even though they are below the canopy. And it just so happens when you look at height of trees, shape of trees, and angle of, um, of the sun rays, that you see three such below canopy areas of relatively high light incidence. Plus the top one in the canopy, you get four. So that, that would be why four. By comparison, in other types of forests, like temperate forests or tundra, uh, the trees are shaped differently. So those are cartoons for trees. And also, the angle at which the, the sun rays are, uh, are shining is different. And for those, you uh, predict a different number of below canopy um, high, light inc high light incidence points, and therefore a different number of clusters that you uh, can predict to find. I have not tried to find clusters in temperate or tundra. One of the issues is because this type of test works better when you have a whole lot of species, which is not the case of uh, temperate forests. Raphael? Yes. Uh, is it okay to interrupt? Oh, for sure. Yes. Okay. I, I forgot to say that. Okay. So there's, there's, there's an interesting leap that you make here relative to everything before. Um, in this model, which is very interesting, um, there is there are some optimal heights to be, um, for, a, a, according to a model of of light interception, um, but that doesn't presume the sets of traits that the plants have to deal with those uh, different light conditions. I mean, as an example, when I took ecology uh, many many decades ago, uh, I was told that the plant the, that there were three or four optimal uh, levels in a, in a forest to seem to be everybody's belief um, and that at each one you had a set of traits that uh, that that more or less brought uh, to be the optimal uh, height that is it wasn't only one thing it might be leaf size uh, uh, various things so so so, I, so that that's where I think that leap is uh, that that is which is a difference I think from what you said before where the traits mapped quite directly. To, to the distribution. Here, you're, you're kind of separating those two. If I'm clear, I hope I'm being clear. All right, so I, I think if I understand what you're saying, um, you're saying there's actually a whole suite of traits that should determine the the, strat, the light strategy of the, of the tree, not just its height. Is that, is that correct? Is that what you're Right, but, but, but more importantly, in, in your for up to this moment, you had a, a single a linear uh, scale where a trait uh, really fit exactly with one-to-one uh, -one with 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 something about the competition whereas in this case you've previously you've you've concluded that there are several optimal locations uh, uh, with height above the surface in the forest and now the but the traits are separated and I'm, I guess I'm saying that there might be several traits so now I'm coming to what you said I, which is correct that there might be several traits for each height that make an optimal uh, form. Yes, yeah, so that's a good point, and it's something that I always keep going back to, which is the realization, the you know, acknowledgement that plants aren't subsumed to a single trait, right? So plants and any organisms they have a large uh, a number of traits that contribute to their ecological strategies, aka their niches. So if we are trying to map niches, then we should be looking at a high-dimensional trait space, not a one-dimensional trait axis. 
um, I think that's a very valid um, criticism and trying to actually tackle it head on, I find very challenging because when you go to high D niche space, you have issues of defining distances, um, you, you run into problems of statistical power at finding patterns because as I will continue to argue here, when you look at single niche axes, you, you may have just several a small number of niches, but when you start increasing the dimensionality of your niche space, now you're talking about many, many niches, possibly one per species, and there's very little hope of finding any type of trait pattern in that type of high, high dimensional niche space. But I, I do take your, your point that this mapping of one trait to one niche is a little bit of a leap. Um, I have separately in other projects that I'm not going to present here, uh, looked at the uh, what happens when uh, multiple traits contribute together to the same single niche axis, what happens in, in, in that trait space in terms of pattern there. Um, short of it is that you still expect to see clustering, but you may, you know, I mean, you still expect cluster to form, but you may not expect to be able to detect it because of issues with a uh, measurement noise. But, um, but I'm not gonna really get into that here. If I could just break your stride for one more minute, mm -hmm. and that is that the worst case scenario I can see is where there is a, a trade-off type of set of traits. For example, the what the optimal height being at the top of the canopy is the lousiest way of transmitting or or uh, of getting nutrients from uh, the soil, and oh, being yeah. near and, and that makes it a complete trade-off type of system, which makes it even more complex. And I'll shut up. For sure, the issue of trade-offs uh, very important. Always, always. Uh always needs to be taken into account. Uh, so I, I, you know, when I used to present on this particular project before, I spent some time asking about, you know, why would you want to not be the tallest tree in the forest, right? If light is all that matters, then being as tall as possible is always the best. Like those are relatively high light incidents, but still much lower than the top of the canopy, right? So why isn't every tree in the forest just being maximally high? And the reason is trade-offs. Um, and in fact, there's more to be said, because when I talked about the birds, I said that, you know, being more similar in terms of beak shape makes you compete more strongly. It is not entirely obvious that having the same height uh, or similar heights will lead to stronger competition. It would seem that here being taller just means you're a better competitor. It doesn't pan out that way because of trade-offs. And I have looked into that, but uh, again, I, I won't really get into that here. But in the interest of time, let me push forward. And thanks, uh, Jeff, for the for the for the point, which is well taken. That you can't just look at a single trade and map it to to a niche like that, at least that easily. So uh, part two. So in part one, I talked about competition for light, right? Uh, so now let's talk about competition for nutrients, which actually Jeff just mentioned. So <clears throat> one advantage of Barrow Colorado Island, and the reason that I keep talking about it, is because we know a lot about that that spot. Um, this 50 hectare plot that I mentioned previously here has been census and extensively studied since the early 80s. And one of the advantages of that is that, for example, we know about the soil chemistry in that plot. Uh, and this is what it looks like in terms of uh, specific nutrients like boron, calcium, copper, iron, potassium, etc. cetera. Uh, here, um, green means low density and uh, yellow to white means high density, and this will flip in, uh, in the next, uh, in a future slide. So basically to the right, you see the nutrients are more abundant than towards the left. Uh, but point is, we know where the nutrients are in this plot, okay? We also know where the trees are, okay? We have mapped all of the trees, all of the stems in this plot, Okay, and we know their geographic coordinates, so I can plot something like this. The colors here uh, represent species, and you know, just based on colors, it might look like there's about 10. Actually, this is almost 200 species here, and there's just not enough colors in the rainbow that we can distinguish to, to, to show you the diversity, the species diversity we have here. Um, so the question now is, can we connect this map of trees to those maps of nutrients that I saw before? And does that tell us anything about competition and niches among trees. 
So now I'm going to show the same funnel that I, show, I showed before, where you have the same uh, processes in mind. So dispersal, again, that island is surrounded by forest. You have drift, right? So basically just stochasticity. And you have selection, which uh, in, in this context is understood as competition for soil nutrients and also local abiotic filtering. So you might imagine that local conditions in the soil might filter for some species versus others, depending on how well adapted they are to those local conditions, right? And in this case, we also have a conditioning factor, which is a heterogeneous but autocorrelated landscape. And we want to know when all of these processes are acting together, what kind of pattern do we expect to see in terms of the spatial distribution of the trees? So in this case, I'm sure I don't need to run a model to, to, to see, we expect basically species to track whatever environment they're good at, right? So we expect spatial clustering of trees, of species, namely species with similar environmental niches should cluster together. Okay, how do we tackle that problem? Um, connecting this to this. One thing that won't work is to just stare at this plot and try to see pattern here, right? I mean, I can't really say there's anything non-random about this plot other than the fact there's a lot of green trees here, right? Okay, so one of the things you can do is <clears throat> simplify the plot by focusing on species pairs, right? So if you look at those two species here, those are all of the trees of those particular two species, Anthozylum macmoniae and Drypedes standalii. So what you see here, uh, I hope you agree, is that where you tend to see a lot of one of them, you tend to see very few of the other, right? And the opposite is true over here, where they actually both seem to like to live in similar conditions. Okay, so this is Dryperi stanlaia and Octea widei. Okay, so point is some species pairs, you can clearly see that they tend to not co occur and others tend to co occur. So the method I'll propose here is to treat this species assemblage as a network where the nodes are species and the edges between the nodes are the degree of spatial closeness between species. So for example, these two here would have a strong edge between them. These two, sorry, these two would have a strong edge between them. These two would have a very weak edge. So if you understand the network as a binary network, this will have no edge between the two species and these two species would have an edge connecting them if you decide to, to be binary about it. And the objective now is having this network where I have my edges and I'm omitting the numbers here, the weights of the edges. Um, I wanna find modules of highly connected nodes, right? So something like that. If I found those, then well, we'll be able to make some interpretations about what that means. But this is the idea, right? I want um, to find modules in my full network of species. So sure enough, when I do that, I do find modules. In fact, I find four of them. And here are my uh, species again. So on the left, the same map you saw before, but now instead of coloring by species, I color by group, by module. And now, presumably, you can see the order coming out of the chaos, right? So there's clearly a domain here of red, a domain here of green, a domain here of blue, and over here of yellow. So those are species that tend to occur next to each other spatially. Okay, and this is the adjacency matrix. Now I'm being binary about it. So a dark pixel means the species are connected to each other. Uh, meaning they're found close to each other more than you would expect by chance. And by close here, I mean within 20 meters of each other. The trees of those species are found within 20 meters of each other more often than you would expect by chance, given their abundances. And what you see is this adjacency matrix is blocked diagonal. It looks very strongly uh, blocked diagonal, indicating that indeed species in the same module, so color the same, coloring in the same way, tend to be connected to each other and they tend to not be connected to the other species. Is that significant? Well, if you try to run the same algorithm, module finding algorithm in uh, reference communities where you shuffle around the species identities of those trees, this is a distribution of optimal modularity that I find for those reference communities. And this is what I found for BCI. So you can see that clearly this is not artifactual. This is not, could not be explained by chance. So BCI is very modular in terms of, and BCI here means Barrow Colorado Island, the forest that we're talking about very modular in terms of spatial distribution of trees. To go back to those nutrient maps, and I'm gonna collapse all of them here into a single map showing the principal component, uh, you see some autocorrelated pattern. It's not random. Ignore the lines, you can just look at the colors. The lines are topographic lines, they're elevation. 
but in terms of nutrient concentration, you see the nutrients tend to, co to be concentrated on the right side. And, and this is where, where the colors split, where I said before the dark green was low, now green is high. Um, and here's the distribution of the groups that I found, the red group, the green group, the blue group, and the yellow group of, of species, okay? And you can probably, just staring at this, see that there are associations between some of my groups and some of these colors, right? So over here, for example, you can compare with that, right? Uh, over here, you can compare with this, right? And so forth. Now, so continuing with this uh, association between species and nutrients, what happens when I look at the correlation between nutrient density and um, <clears throat> density of trees of a particular group? you see these very distinct and easily distinct uh, types of associations with nutrients in general. Namely, red species are found in high nutrient areas. Yellow species are found in low nutrient areas. Green and blue are intermediate, but mostly red and green like nutrients and blue and yellow tend to be found in uh, uh, nutrient poor areas. Some of these columns seem to, seem to be uh, exceptions. Well, aluminum, the very first one here, is actually not a nutrient, it's actually a toxin to plant growth. So it kind of shows the opposite uh, pattern of uh, the nutrients. Phosphorus also is very interesting. It seems to not go along with the other nutrients. And that's because it has a different spatial distribution than most other nutrients. And go back a few slides here. This is phosphorus. And you see that the other nutrients seem to be telling the same story, but phosphorus is going its own way, as the uh, Fleetwood Mac would say. All right. So what about traits? So now if I label my species by, by trait, by, 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 call, by, by group that I just inferred, right? What do their traits look like? Are they distinctive? And what I would argue is that yes, you can, you can see that trait distribution in terms of wood density and vital rates are distinctive for my four groups. Uh, a, a few words on what these two traits mean. Wood density is what the word says, right? It's how dense the wood is after you, when you measure after removing the water. Traits, uh, trees with high wood density are trees that tend to have high longevity. So those trees are investing in structural tissue. They plan to stick, stick around for a while. So they need their wood to be good quality wood. So high wood density means long living trees, okay? Vital rates here means how fast each tree grows year to year and also uh, mortality rates. So it's a combined measure here of mortality rates and growth rates. So high vital rate basically means uh, a fast lifestyle. And what you see is a trend, right? A negative trend in wood density with uh, association with nutrients. So groups associated with high nutrients tend to have high longevity, high wood density. Species found in low resource areas tend to actually be short-lived species. And you see a consistent trend for vital rates consistent with wood density, which is that fast living trees, which are also the ones that don't live very long, are found in high nutrient areas. Sorry, low nutrient areas. This always gets me confused. And slow living trees are found in high nutrient areas. Okay. By the way, uh, for those of you, you know, wondering about, you know, obviously you're going to find a correlation here because both of these things are autocorrelated. If the groups are autocorrelated and so are the nutrients. I did test against that and was able to show that it's not. So this here cannot be just explained by the fact that these, both this side and this side are autocorrelated. Essentially, you can train a machine learner to, to predict um, the species group based on the nutrients. And the predictions work a lot better when you're predicting the actual species groups than when you're predicting reference species groups, which are just as autocorrelated as these ones, but shifted in the plot. Okay, so what are the findings from part, from part two? Species are grouped into discrete, so, quote unquote, soil niches, despite the continuous nutrient landscape. Species within a niche are mutually similar. Species across niches are dissimilar, as shown by these. You can't, so the idea now flattening that map of, of groups uh, is that species in the same group, they tend to occur together, which in the literature, it's often the expectation is the opposite, that species that have similar strategies would not actually be found living next to each other. They would be found living away from each other to minimize competition. Uh, another thing is if you focus on the traits that I was just telling you about, longevity as represented by wood density, 
and growth as represented by vital rates, there's a clear uh, trade-off between them. Uh, and the trade-off is not only across all of the species, but also if you call them by group, you see that you know the, the, the red and green, so the high nutrient uh, groups are over here on this side, and the blue and yellow are over here on this side. So short-lived species grow fast, they're acquisitive. Long-lived species grow slowly, they are conservative, and the acquisitive and conservative species live on different uh, areas in terms of nutrient availability. Namely, acquisitive species, the blue and yellow, are found where resources are low, and the conservative species, the red and green, are found where resources are high. So again, um, audience participation. Here are, in terms of establishing cause and effect, what is the process causing this pattern? Uh, here are two hypotheses. Hypothesis one, the local environment filters my species. Based on that hypothesis, I would expect acquisitive species to grow in favorable soils. So those are species that grow fast and don't live very long, right? So they need a lot of resource, right? So they should be growing in high nutrient areas. Conservative species, on the other hand, since they're slow and steady, they should grow in unfavorable soils simply because they're better adapted to those soils. That would be my hypothesis one. Hypothesis two, actually the species modify the local environment. Acquisitive species are strong competitors. They are very good at drawing resources and therefore they quickly de deplete the resources where they grow. Conservative species by comparison with acquisitive species are weak competitors and therefore less good at absorbing resources. They keep the resources closer to the supply point of the resource. We're assuming here that the resources have a supply point. So which of the two hypotheses here is the pattern that I'm finding supporting H1 or H2? Or neither, but you know, they're opposite to each other. So well, definitely leaning toward H2, but I'll admit I find it confusing. Well, I lean towards H2 as well. I say H2 is the winner, which um, is actually consistent with the idea, classical idea in community ecology, where strong competitors are simply going to be uh, depleting resource levels to lower levels than the weak competitors can sustain a population on, right? So a strong competitor would deplete resources more than a weak competitor. The fast growing species will be found then in low resource soils, low nutrient soils. Now, you mentioned being confused by this, um, and you expand on, on the, the source of confusion. Because I also find it confusing. Well, so I, so, you know, I'm, I'm bringing my thinking about phytoplankton to thinking about trees, right? Mm -hmm. But, um, I, I tend to think of the fast growing species as not necessarily the best competitors, right? They do well when resources are rich and don't necessarily draw them down to low levels. Yeah, uh, so I have to say that I definitely went into this expecting the opposite result as well. I went into this expecting something more like this. Yeah. Right? Acquisitive species need high resources. Conservative species can tolerate low resources. That's what I expected to see. I saw the reverse, and then I realized actually, if you inverse the if you reverse the causal arrow here, then you get closer to you know explaining what you're seeing. The acquisitive so there's a supply point, right? So resources are coming in. Acquisitive species quickly take them out, so quickly absorb them into biomass, right? So then in that case, you would actually see fast growing species in low resource areas, right? But this, um, this kind of- Rafael, one second. How yes. did you distinguish from the data that you showed H1 versus H2? So according to H1, you expect fast growing species to be found in high resource areas. According to H2, you expect fast growing species to be found in low resource areas, right? And I found fast growing species, so fast growing species in low resource areas, right? Slow growing species in high resource areas. So that will be consistent with H2. Okay, so fast growing is, is also basically, it is 
high mortality as well, right? It's yes, fast lifestyle basically. Yes, fast lifestyle. Yes. So it could also be related to mortality rather than growth rate. I mean, it's, it, they're there together. You cannot really separate them from each other. Um, but also the other question I had here is that you say are, are strong competitors and quickly deplete. Um, so how did you measure the strength of competition? Yes, that's a great question. And I'm not doing that at all, right? So I'm not measuring competition. Uh, I'm just inferring it, right? Uh, but that is definitely a prediction that needs to be, uh, that needs to be um, tested, right? Are the species that I'm finding, are the green and the, um, are those species here strong competitors relative to these? And that was actually gonna get into what I was gonna just ask, which is this begs the question, why don't the, if these are simply better competitors than those, why don't they exclude them? Why don't these species exclude these species, right? Because I'm saying they're stronger competitors. And, and like Rajit, Rajit, I take your point, I'm not actually measuring uh, competitive uh, uh, ability here to even you know ask the question. But if this hypothesis is correct, then now you need to explain how come you have coexistence, right? Uh, so the answer, the one answer you would always get from an ecologist is there is some trade-off, right? There's something about these areas in the forest that these species are not good at growing here. And because of that, those species that are weaker competitors get a chance to recruit and colonize in there, right? What could that thing be? Well, possibly toxins, right? So I mentioned aluminum, right, as not a nutrient. So in that data that I aggregated, the nutrient data, some of the cations there are actually toxic at the levels found on VCI. So manganese is one of them. So I think it's possible, although I have not looked at this in, uh, carefully, that you could have two niche axes here, which also would explain why I have four groups. One would be nutrient concentration and another would be tolerance to toxins or you know, something that's not being captured by uh, just the nutrient list that I looked at. It could be that these species here, even though they're weak competitors, they're tolerant. And those here are strong competitors, but not tolerant. And then for some reason over here on the right side, you have something that is inhospitable to the growth of these plants. Um, and then the, the, the white four groups, possibly two by two niches, what I mean by that is, you could have something like a break into blue and yellow on one side, red and green on the other, and that break is by nutrient concentration. But then you could have another break to, this, to explain the distinct, distinction between yellow and blue and green and red coming from level of tolerance to, to toxins and to you know, um, things that stop plant growth. So it will be interesting to look into that in more. Uh, more detail, but that will be my best explanation as to why we are finding this type of uh, evidence or this type of uh, hypothesis being supported and also seeing uh, coexistence of the four groups. Um, so let me see. Yeah. So, so would it be the case that um, places where um, resources are uh, quickly depleted as in H2, that they are the places where Basically, and effectively, light isn't limiting because their their success is predicated in their acquisition of resources, and then they just start growing mm -hmm. upward. Mm -hmm. And then, in contrast, this right right side area will be one where light is limiting. Would that be the idea? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think you're 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 uh, postulating not postulating, but raising the possibility that light is that other other axis here uh, that could explain the. Um, why these don't exclude those. So I don't- Well, it, it might not be a, a, an explanatory factor. It might just be a consequence of the mm. success based on, on, on nutrient use. Yes. Um, so in other words, those here are uh, light limited and those here are nutrient limited. Effectively, yeah. Yeah. I just don't see why light would have a different, like why would there be a different distribution of light over here and over here, right? Because it's not like there's a gradient in, for example, canopy height from the left to the right. It would only work if the diversity 
in these two different places are very different from each other. So for example, in the, in the, in the, in the left side, that this, these are species that are uh, strongly strong competitors, if I understand your model correctly, that, that very few species are those types and, and therefore they're less light, light limited. Okay, so I can tell you that the number of species in the groups, actually, I don't need to tell you, I can show you uh, here, right? This is the number of species in each of the groups. So the red and the green are the right side, right? And, though, and those are the conservative species. Those are the acquisitive species over here. So you can see that pretty much they're split in the middle, right? Half of the species on BCI are being categorized as the, the blue and yellow, so this side and the other half is over here. So it's about the same level of diversity just in terms of species counts. Terms okay. Of yeah. But now you could also then, I, I mean, one of the problems about this is that everything devolves in a way in your model to the source. That is what you're basically saying is I'm taking this little patch and they're all coming from elsewhere. So everything that happened, mm -hmm. happened elsewhere, um, which reminds me very much of a, uh, a paper that Joe Connell wrote, which is very famous, uh, called something like the ghost of competition past. Yeah. Where he, he says, look, uh, uh, it's all a matter of where they came from and now they're in this target. Uh, and, and in fact, uh, uh, I, my memory is that Peter Grant even used that as an explanation for Darwin's finches, which are way fewer species than, than mm -hmm. tropical rainforests, that, that, that consequences are often who happens to wind up on the island. And it might be two different Dar species of Darwin's finches, um, and 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 I, I, Connell, as I recall, led that led him to say, "Look, uh, I really don't believe that any of the uh, uh, things that happen in tropical forests, which he was very interested in, as you probably know, he spent a lot of time in Australian uh, tropical forests. He he believed that all of this had nothing to do with with any long term competitive interaction and niche subdivision at all. And if, given the model that you're using." That absolutely fits to it because your model is that there's species everywhere and they're coming onto a new spot and they're all interacting and sorting out according to their traits. Yeah. Yes. So I guess where I would, if I understood what you said about uh, Connell's opinions on the tropical forests, I would agree with Connell that it's definitely not the case that my species here are each of them occupying a single niche and they're differentiating themselves as much as possible. In fact, you're seeing pretty much the opposite, right? You see groups of species that are actually maximally similar. And they are pretty much sharing uh, the niche. Um, so just to summarize and actually get into that point. Um, so I open with a question, do competing species coexist for difference or similarities? And what we found through part one and two is that it's a combination of both, right? So species fall into groups. The groups are separated, but inside the groups, the species are actually mutually similar. In part one, we saw that in terms of max height. In part two, we saw that in terms of you know, life history strategies and association to soil chemistry. And the takeaway to repeat myself is high species diversity. And I'll keep in mind that this is applicable to very species communities like tropical forests, not necessarily more temperate areas where you see lower, uh, lower numbers of species. High species diversity is the outcome of coexistence on multiple niche axes. And this, I, I guess I didn't uh, um, harp on too much, but if you, just part one and two, they talk about completely different niche axes, right? And you can imagine adding more parts here where each time you talk about a different niche axis and you're gonna see groups in each of them, right? On each niche axis, you can expect well-spaced groups of similar species. So then how do you explain coexistence? Because you know those of us familiar with coexistence theory say that each species has to have its own niche to be able to you know, coexist and not be excluded by others. Well, you could imagine that it is the combination of niche axes right, which very quickly, when you start adding more niche dimensions, end up giving a niche to each species. But any individual niche axis that you care to look at, what you're going to see is the opposite of limiting similarity, which in my opinion could go a long way in terms of explaining uh, this table here. Uh, yep, this table here. More than half the time you actually see species to be more similar than different. In fact, to me, what needs to be explained is how come sometimes you actually find species to be more different than expected by chance. My guess is these are going to be communities with a low species diversity where it is plausible that even on a single niche axis, you could have um, species each occupying their own niche. 
Okay, so now that I walked back all the way, let me go back to the end and acknowledge my lab and conversations with Atma, Mihir, and Carlos that uh, influence some of my thinking, particularly in uh, part two, and also my uh, co-authors for both part one and two, and I ask for inviting me to the talk, and uh, I guess I have just a few minutes uh, for questions. So I will stop here and uh, answer any questions you may have. Thanks, Raphael. Um, people can raise their hands or just shout out any any questions? I have a, just a quick question to kick things off. I was going to um, ask earlier, and then we, we got talking about other things. But it, I'm wondering whether, given the importance of light on structuring the competition in these tropical species, whether you could test um, that hypothesis looking at, at steeply sloped areas. Um, still tropical, still lots of species, but you'd expect the light dynamics to be very different. And in that case, uh, maybe on a steep slope, uh, height is is not the advantage that would have been otherwise. Yeah, that's an interesting uh, that's an interesting point. So I wouldn't be able to test that with that BCI plot that I've been showing you because even though there's a gradient in elevation, it isn't particularly strong. But there are uh, areas I think even in Panama that have been studied. What is it? Is it a Sherman plot? There's a plot in Panama that has a much steeper slope, and I could. Uh, that does make predictions about the number of clusters that I would find uh, over there. It should be not four. If I can work out the physics of how light works in there, it's uh, a good idea. Yeah, you'd certainly think less competition for sunlight, but maybe more competition for um, water. I don't know um, what the hydrology might might do in those more steeply sloped areas. Ironically, so here's another source of puzzlement for me. Um, uh, VCI, we have the hydro hydrologic map as well, um, and the weird thing. So I mentioned topography here. So this here, this area of BCI is on a slope, okay? It's a relatively small slope. It's not a mountain or anything. It is also the area with the most water. So my understanding is a slopey area will be an area with less water, right? And the, the, the plateau underneath it would actually have more water. But that's not the case. For BCI, by far, the wettest area is this slopey area here. It kind of depends on the prevailing direction of the of the front. So it could be that that as the the air is rising up up a slope, that it's actually uh, causing um, moisture to precipitate out of the clouds. And so those areas can be quite wet. On the other side, you might have just a steeply sloped area, but it's not going to be as wet. So I think it depends a lot on on how that slope intersects with the prevailing uh, fronts. Okay. Um, yeah, I wonder. Like the spatial scales we're talking about here. This is. Thousand meters is five hundred meters. I it's quite know. small. Yes, that's what yeah. I was going to say. So I don't know that I expect different fronts in different areas of the of just this plot of forest. You know, but the wettest parts here look to be maybe towards the base of those slopes, which is to say, if the water is running downhill. Oh, this this is not a water map, by the way. This is just I'm just showing you that the plot. Oh, right. This is nutrients. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. The water matches those lines pretty well, actually. Yeah. Interesting. I, I didn't show you a map, a water map here, but yeah. There's also a swamp here. This is wet because this is a swamp. And there's a stream over here. Yeah. But yeah, it will be interesting to, to look at us and actually slope the area and see what the differences are, both with regards to uh, light incidence and uh, moisture levels. Other questions? Yeah, Raphael, I, I was struck by the similarity of some of your dynamical equations with those that, that we of course get in um, a chemical reaction dynamics and of course it's no coincidence i mean there's sort of like a couple first order potentially nonlinear equations and uh in chemical reactions of course once we get more than a couple of a couple of species involved you can sort of have non-monotonic approaches to steady state and you even get um I don't know when it was, maybe back in the 70s or earlier, uh, even get solutions which don't have a steady state, which are oscillating solutions. And yeah. Are you expecting to see things like that in these solutions? And that, that sort of gets me to a question that uh, maybe in this particular setting, you're seeing something that you know is a long-term steady state of the environment you're looking at, but uh, 
do you actually know that or you you're just looking at a snapshot in time right right so i think you're talking about this model here right yeah yeah yeah, so um, this model, I would say, it's, it's actually it's probably borrowed from, um, I don't know if it's borrowed from chemistry, but you, you can write this model in chemistry. This, this is basically mass action between species I, species J, right? So you can imagine this as being uh, uh, gases in a box. And um, in terms of uh, steady states, competitive systems like this, every coefficient here is positive, right? And the abundances, as you saw from here, they do not oscillate. Um, but you can have predator prey systems here, right? Or disease pathogen host situations where alpha IJ could be positive and alpha JI could be negative, right? In those, you do see uh, oscillations. Okay, it's the, the, the equivalent of this for predator prey system, the, the, the classic prediction is a cycle, right? Where one hunts the other. So you have um, sinusoidal waves up and down in a predator, predators and prey. Um, so the, the models that I've been looking at are models that are strictly competitive. And for those, I don't think you can get um, equilibria that are not of the, of the focal type of a focal point type of equilibrium. I don't think you can get uh, cycles uh, in strictly competitive systems. Rajit. Um, what say you about this? Um, I think you can, well, you can get extinctions, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, um, but yes, I don't think you can get oscillations. Uh, what you what, can... One question I have, by the way, about this equation. Mm -hmm. well, I know the equation, but um, how you convert the um, trait axis and the trait overlaps into the alpha values. Right is a critical component, right? That that relationship can take many forms. It doesn't yes. have to be linear. Does it affect the result? Yeah, I agree with you, which is why I did this part, right? So I didn't want to be beholden to that assumption of the alpha as coming from overlaps and then having that kind of strict relationship of being monotonically decreasing with trade difference. So I did simulations of, uh, scenarios where my my consumers are competing with each other indirectly by depleting resource, right? So resource here is seeds, resource here is space. And in both cases, we saw, uh, let me actually remove these things. So you, you see clustering, uh, very similar type of clustering. Although like I would say the competition colonization trade-offs, they show somewhat different behavior than those types of consumer resource models in that one of the niches is much, much bigger than the other niches. Over here, the niches are kind of about the same size. And by niches, I mean groups of species here. You see about the same carrying capacity to each of the groups. Over here, that's very different. I, I cut this off here, but this goes way up. Uh, and I think it's very hard to get this model to work where um, small seed is, small seeded species, which are over here, have the same level of success as large seeded species over here. But anyway, to your answer your question, Rajit, I, uh, I am I'm aware and, and agree with you that there are many ways to define competition coefficients other than MacArthur's way. And this here was a, what my way of handling uh, that question. And the answer, fortunately, was uh, that you get clusters in all of them. In fact, as I told you before, it was when I saw this that I actually started taking cluster seriously. And I was like, oh, this is not just a Waka Volterra thing. Uh, Jeff. Yeah, maybe you, you addressed this and I missed it, but um, an interesting question I would ask is how long did it take for this differentiation that you can see now in Barrow, Colorado Highland to develop? You're asking me a natural history question? Uh, so it's, 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 it is one that matters when you think about it. I mean, you know, would, did this develop in 100 years? Did it develop in 1,000 years? Um, and then if we look at all of the, uh, the species that can go anywhere in any particular plot, how long would this take to develop as a a, a thought experiment that one could also think about. Yeah, so I think you're getting into questions of uh, different time scales of in processes. 
And that's important as well. Um, so I mentioned dispersal in the talk, because I mean immigration, right? And I didn't get into too much detail, but exactly how much immigration that matters, right? Because when you talk about other processes in addition to competition shaping your community, the relative time scales of the competitive exclusion process and immigration, right? And also the strength of stochasticity, which will be related to the size of the community, all of those things matter, how much you're putting into of each. So if you put in too much immigration, you see no pattern because immigration is random. If you put too little immigration, again, you see no pattern because now you're giving time for species to exclude each other, right? And, and, and you get into the limiting similarity type of scenario of the, the six birds that you saw in the first, uh, the first simulation. So um, interestingly, BCI being BCI, people have estimated the uh, degree of uh, immigration into the island. Um, and I actually forget now, but the, there's a there's a number to it in, in terms of of the new recruits in that 50 hectare plot. How many are offspring of plants that were not inside the plot uh, on a say five year basis? And that's actually uh, well known. But in terms of the diversity on the island, I don't know how long that diversity has been going on. I know a little bit about the history of the island, namely that it has not not always been an island. It became an island with the construction of the Panama Canal in 1900. Uh, and before that, it was contiguous forest. So now it's isolated somewhat from the surrounding areas, uh, but um, it wasn't always the case. Now, what did, did that do to, to diversity on BCI? I actually uh, wouldn't, wouldn't know what to tell you. Yeah, I, I think the, the, it's probably a, a problematic to even talk about the limiting similarity model um, relative to what you're doing now, because the limiting similarity model purports to explain the evolution of the differentiation of sizes based on some dynamic process that reaches a rapid equilibrium. Whereas in your case, you are selecting a set of species coming from somewhere else that have already evolved their traits, which I think is the Connell ghost of competition model, pass model, and coming and sorting out. And that, in fact, is the, the model that I think everybody who works on, on intertidal rocky shore ecology accepts uh, and, and going back to the uh, the idea of a universal uh, uh, um, uh, differentiation with height around the world which the uh, Stevensons uh, developed uh, and no, nobody I think thinks that this is something that's evolving again and again but rather it's sorting again and again mm -hmm. and I think that fits your 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 model a little better yeah I think limiting similarity could be a better model of like I said, communities with fewer species, but I don't think it's a good model of uh, tropical forests. I go even further than that. I don't think it even works uh, on, on any uh, dynamic basis, even for uh, small diversity communities. Maybe it happened once, but they're repeating it again and again in a dynamic way. Yes, because as you can see in that first animation I showed, even for a closed community, which eventually will hit a stable state, right? It takes a while to get there. That was actually the first observation in terms of this, this type of thing, is that regardless of whether the stochasticity, immigration, et cetera, why would you expect that final state to be the observed state in nature, right? When it clearly depends on timescales that could be vastly longer than uh, what you have in, in the observed systems. Thanks. Excellent. Well, um, we've, we're about 10 minutes over, so we'll, we'll let uh, Raphael go. I think many of you will, will know where to find him if you if you want and have more questions. Um, but I appreciate that. I think uh, as a newish uh, member of the IACS community, I think there's lots of opportunities to um, see how this connects to some of the other computational work being done at IACS. And uh, yeah, thanks so much, uh, Raphael. It was super interesting. Thanks, Heather. Hey, 